Okay, first of all, let me let me just let everybody know that I am actually excuse me. Hey sound guy, turn it up, dude. Dude, I yelled at Jeopardy two nights in a row and got trashed two nights in a row. You're lucky I'm even upright. No, because we got ripped off. Okay. First of all, let me let me let you know that I am not R S. He was um requested by his employer, the man, not to actually give this talk. So since I'm a friend of his and I've done some forensic stuff in the past, I'm more of a network monkey than a file system monkey. And uh, so he asked me if I'd be willing to give his talk so that you guys didn't get screwed out of one talk. I had no idea he was quite this popular. <laughs> I thought it'd be about three of you and my friends who wanted to go drink afterwards. But So here it goes. So. Okay. <clears throat> Basically, uh, the talk that, that Rob was wanting to give is uh, kind of an intro to a uh, file system uh, analysis. Uh, actually, there won't be any analysis, discussion of analysis. It's hey, sound okay. dude, can you roll them up? Yeah, can the sound guys just boost it a little? By sound guy, we mean you. Can you slide them up, slide, slap the pots? No? Yes, no. no. All right. Maybe. Um, I walk over there and do it. Is that Hold better? Can everybody yeah. hear at this point still no? How about now? Can you hear me now? Wow. Can you hear me now? <laughs> hey, it's a Verizon commercial. Okay. <clears throat> Basically, the, uh, the talk that, that Rob has asked me to present today is, is essentially um, a very basic introduction into how to properly um, acquire data from a potentially compromised system or a suspect system uh, and the legal aspects of what you, you have to keep in mind um, when you want to ensure that you, you, you know, have everything done properly when presenting it in a court of law. So. Um, I will do my best to get through the slides. If you ask me a question that I cannot answer, hopefully Rob is around here somewhere and he will unofficially answer your question. <laughs> but um, here we go. All right, basically the, the most important thing you need to keep in mind is that when, you're, when you're, you have a system that, that you suspect has you know, been tampered with or, or has something that you're interested in, in, uh, in, in checking, you have to ensure that you do not alter or contribute to the the modification of, of files on that file system um, because that that 's like the first way anytime you anytime you actually open a file you modify it you know, whether you realize it or not you, you you change the access times you change quite a lot of uh, very subtle metadata associated with that file so it 's important that you follow certain very, very strict procedures to try and intrude as little as possible on the suspect system. Um, oh, and by the way, the typos are not mine. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so one of the first things you have to consider is whether or not, um, if it's a running system, you, you have to actually look at the, the, the entire aspect of, of what the system is, is doing. You, you have to consider, is it connected to a network? Is it currently powered up? Is it powered down? If it's powered up, um, is there data that's actually held in memory that you want to try and access? Um, because uh, some, some people, when they tamper a system, will leave a Trojan behind. And as soon as they see you know, some sort of shutdown procedure or whatever, um, it, it will remove whatever data you might have actually been in interested in so you have to actually be very careful about about not doing something without thinking through thoroughly first what you you know what what may be the ramifications of what you're doing um, so and, and <laughs> change <laughs> but as, as Rob says here and uh, you, you, only, you only get actually you only get one chance to do it right, because as as I mentioned previously, if there if the system has been trojaned, 
there's a good possibility that if, you, if, if you're not careful and you do the wrong thing, you lose everything you're actually interested in. Um, there's many, many ways to, to actually acquire the data um, that, that with, without you know, modifying it too much. Uh, I, I personally, some of the things that Rob has in here, I haven't used because frankly, I'm a Unix bigot, so <clears throat> caveat mTOR. Um, also, every, every intrusion is, 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 is a unique situation. I mean, you know, it could be a standalone system. It could be, an AT, you know, we could be talking about ATMs. Um, you know, it, it could be a system that, that's connected to a network. It, it could be a multi-home system. You don't know. So you actually have to be very careful and document your, uh, your, your, uh, your, your entire uh, data acquisition uh, process. And by, by documentation, I actually mean, you know, photographs, notes, as well as uh, acquiring the actual file system data that you're interested in. Um, basically, what the talk will cover is what, what, uh, what are you actually trying to, to accomplish uh, with the forensic acquisition of the file systems, and what, what uh, things can make that difficult what, or, or impossible, depending on how badly you screw up. Um, it, 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 he also had, he will we will also cover the uh, preparation the proper preparation of evidence media so that it is admissible in court and um, if done correctly uh, doesn't get struck down or mitigated um, the, as well as the uh, proper handling of the suspect system you're you're not actually going to utilize the, the potentially compromised system for anything more than acquiring a copy of the data off of it. And, and then at that point, you will enter the uh, suspect media into your chain of custody so that you can, you can have a very distinct trail of who has had access to, to the uh, suspect media uh, and when and what was performed. So uh, this is all basically required for, for your uh, court cases to ensure that there is no doubt that whatever was being alleged to have been found on the suspect media was not put there by you or somebody else involved in the prosecution. Um, there's actually multiple ways to do it, as I mentioned earlier. There, there are hardware solutions for, for accessing a copy of the uh, data on the suspect media. There are also uh, software mechanisms for for doing the same thing, they all have uh, they all have you know certain certain abilities that that make them unique. Some of them, and then they all have their limitations. So you may actually want to use more than one method to acquire your your suspect media data to to for anal for for a later analysis. Um, and the other thing you probably want to, to you're going to want to do is use some kind of uh, integrity verification mechanism. Generally, that, that would be a, a cryptographic hashing uh, that, that you would take of the file system image so that you can further prove that it has not been tampered or altered in any way since you acquired the data. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, Rob also is not a lawyer. <laughs> so do not consider this talk as legal advice or legal opinion. Uh, neither neither of us actually speak for anyone other than ourselves, and <laughs> most often we don't do that very well. Um, so if you if if you actually you know want to do these things, if you do it in the privacy of your own home or whatever, that's fine. If you, if you decide after sitting through this talk that you're now a forensic specialist, um, and you go and try and perform one of these, uh, perform a data acquisition on, on a suspect system at your work and you screw up the boss's computer and he's pissed off, not my fault. So you really ought to check with the policies of your organization, um, your IT staff, your, you know, your legal staff before using any of these tools in an investigation. And I frankly would suggest that you spend a lot of time doing this before you even think you're going to do it properly because it is a very exacting, very precise process that must be followed in, in order to not um, taint the, the data that you're going to present in court. Um, this is basically a glossary of terms that, that you should be familiar with uh, to, to make 
the uh, talk a little bit more understandable. By digital evidence, he basically, it, it, basically that, that is the file system on the suspect um, system that you're, you're, you're trying to acquire. Um, suspect or original drive suspect media or original drive media is basically the, the possibly tainted system or the possibly malicious system that you're interested in. Uh, forensics media or evidence drive or media is, is basically the, the tools that, that you will use to, to acquire the, is, it, it's basically the, the system that you will use to actually acquire the data off the, uh, the suspect system. Um, acquisitions and imaging, basically, the, that's two different terms for, her, for, for grabbing all the data uh, off the uh, suspect system. Um, imaging is just basically creating one or more image files of the suspect system that are a bit for bit copy so that you get everything, um, not just files, the, the files that are on there, you, you get the slack space. Um, many people don't actually realize that when you, when you delete a file, you're not actually erasing that file. What you're doing is deleting an entry in, in a master database on the drive that says it's okay to overwrite the, uh, the, uh, this space on the drive, but that doesn't necessarily happen right away. Um, and not only that, uh, when you copy a file, you quite often don't copy just what you, you th think you're copying. If you open up a document, and you write a couple of things into it and then save it and then you open it up later and delete one of those things because you decide that whoever you're giving the document to has no reason to, to know that stuff. Um, that data is actually still lying around. So when you copy that, that file over somewhere else, what you thought you deleted is actually still there in what's called Slack space. And so you have to, you have to be very, very careful about imaging the entire file system so that you get things that are in Slack space that may actually be pertinent to what you're interested in. Okay. Um, the next thing is chain of custody. Chain of custody is basically uh, nothing more than, than a, a hard copy of every, every individual has had access to the suspect system as well as the, uh, the, uh, the forensic media system and what they did and when they did it and things like that because these have to be, the chain of custody is uh, an admissible item in a court case. Verif verification hashes and checksums. That's what I mentioned earlier about <coughs> wanting to create a hash to, uh, to check the integrity of your, of your acquisition uh, file system so that you can prove it's not been tampered with. Trusted forensic environment is essentially the, the acquisition system um, because it, it, must, it must actually, you must have it so that you can prove that it is, it, the integrity has not been tainted at all on your system because if everybody in, in a particular area has access to your, your forensic uh, acquisition system, then you can't prove that somebody hasn't altered that to you know, modify whatever, whatever data you're trying to, to acquire to hide whatever they're interested in hiding. So um, trusted forensics assist, the, the trusted forensic environment may, just basically means um, having a means of proving that, that your, your acquisition system um, is exactly what you, you think is, it is and nothing more. Um, original copies and work copies. Basically, the way if the they way can't you figure that it, out, they, they're pretty weak, dude. I know, but basically, the way you do it is you do, you never actually want to do um, any analysis on um, uh, on your suspect system. You 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 want to capture all the data from the suspect system onto a separate piece of media. That separate piece of media actually then is what gets um, admitted to court and um, quite often you will have that as your means of. Um, analysis too. So uh, what happens is you basically, you, you capture all the data off the suspect system and once you, you've done so and the, the system has been entered into the chain of custody, then that suspect system is, is you know, placed in, a, in a, a, a lock space where nobody has access to it anymore. Okay, um, it does not fully cover acquiring volatile system information. Uh, basically, there's only Slight, uh, slight information here on how to actually capture uh, data that, that resides on, uh, in memory on a running system. Uh, there's too many, too many different 
systems and too, too many different ways to actually do it in a 50-minute talk to adequately explain all this. Um, quite often, uh, you, you, when you're trying to grab data from memory, you, your system will write out, um, you know, temporary files and things that to the to the uh, file system. So you have to be very careful that that when you're trying to grab volatile data, you're not you're not modifying the file system that you're interested in as well. Uh, you, you need, uh, and the third point is um, that you, as I said, it has to be, it's a very exacting process. So you, you want to, you, you want to make sure that you, you know exactly what to do, what, what you're going to do, and carefully step through those. Don't, you know, don't take any shortcuts or, you know, and, and frankly, I, I, when I have done forensic uh, acquisitions, I will, uh, or or some of my staff, I will actually have a written set of steps and insist that they follow them. No matter how many times they've done it, that's the only really care a way you can carefully not miss something or potentially taint the uh, system you're interested in. Um, volatile uh, examples of volatile data would be you know run runtime and performance st stats, which is basically in most Unix systems, you know things in the uh, the uh, pseudo proc file system, uh, time, date, time zone settings, all you know, all these things are, are volatile because some of them are easily changed. Um, the the act of running process listings is another volatile thing because, as I mentioned earlier, if there's a trojan and and you you trigger that trojan, it it may either stop running whatever process that that it was running that you were probably interested in or. Um, if some of you have attended the uh, rootkit uh, talks, you, you'll see that they can hide those processes, keep them running, but you won't be able to actually find them. Um, logged in user listings, that obviously is, is for a network connected system. Um, open files, libraries, DLLs in use. Basically, <clears throat> it, you know, it, it's, it's different for every system, but you, you can easily, you know, Find find all the files that that are currently in use through the the system processes and and again if you're not careful if there's a trojan or if it's a, a network enabled system and the person that that is doing what you're interested in is actually online and finds out they may they may stop uh, what they're doing unload unload any libraries that that are being used by whatever process they're doing and and you will lose data that that you potentially need in your prosecution. Network activity again, obviously, um, for a network-enabled system is you know what what actually is going on. Um, if if you if you walk up to the system and immediately pull the network cable out of it, you may actually lose data that that you're interested in for your prosecution because that may that may trigger whatever network system uh, process was going on to either stop or well obviously it won't be communicating anymore, and that may trigger it to stop or hide itself. Um, perhaps the, the data you're actually interested in is an ongoing streaming of you know, pornographic material or, or you know, illegal film, you know, file sharing activities. And if you're not careful, those things that, that you need to acquire may stop. So you have to be, it goes back to being very careful about following your steps and, and not deviating from those. Um, let me see, I'm gonna move on. Just through the stuff. Yeah, uh, we're not going to cover cellular phones, palm, you know, PDAs, wireless and wired network communications, wireless programmable keyboards, and EEPROMs. Uh, it would just simply take too long, and obviously, I'm taking too long as it is. So, uh, without further ado, uh, that this uh, the first bullet up here is actually something that that is is quite often looked over, uh, overlooked by by people that don't do this all the time. Um, you know, it is a potentially a crime scene, so you you want to you want to make sure that if if you're going in and looking at the system, you you want to ensure that you know if you, if you start tapping away on the keyboard, you're not you're not destroying fingerprint evidence that may, might be there. As I mentioned before, you you definitely want to document the entire uh, area that you're working in photographically, so that if if something you know somebody comes up and says, well, you know that wasn't my system. You have you have visual evidence that you know whatever whatever they're claiming is probably not true. 
um, you, you want to take a look at every cable connection, whether, whether you know, the system is, is network enabled, if it's connected to a wireless network, if it's connected to a Cat5 fiber network, if it's multi-homed, if there are you know, modems. So you want to carefully, carefully document all that, both, both in, in written form and in photographic form. Um, and consider every incident as if it is going to trial, which you know, basically goes back to set up a, a certain set of, of steps to follow and don't deviate, them, deviate from them regardless. Because if, if it goes to trial, you're going to need all the evidence that you gather. If it doesn't go to trial, it's no big deal. Having more evidence is, is you know, actually a good thing. Um, yes, do not examine your evidence at all until you've properly made a forensic image. Be, uh, the, reason, the reason that he says that is, is basically because if you're not careful, you will taint the data by, by altering access times and things like that. So you want to make sure that you have a complete and, and f thorough forensic image so that if, if somebody questions something, you can actually go back and acquire a second copy of the, the suspect data without having to, to access the suspect system. Um, you, uh, you should you know, try, to, try to interact with the system as, as little as possible. I mean, if, you, if you have to sit down at the suspect system itself, you need to be very careful. But generally, you want to not ever do anything or, or um, attempt to, to check anything on the suspect system. You want to actually make a copy instead. Um, and store, again, store everything in a safe location, which basically, generally for me, since I work for the government, and yes, you can spot the Fed now, um, it means a GSA safe with a, with a high security lock. That's another means that, that gets documented in the uh, chain of custody that proves that you know it was difficult, if not impossible, for someone to have tainted the, the system data that you're presenting in your court case. Um, Pretty much I, all this just really says is to keep track of what you fucking do. I mean, if you're ever going into a government investigation, you're going to be working with people who've done other types of investigations, mostly physical, and you just need to make sure you don't taint the digital data. The chain of custody is exactly the same for physical data as digital data, as long as you don't taint it. Uh, all these things are just reiterating how you have to be careful not to taint what you have, not to modify anything, and only work on copies of it. Just It's a very simple concept for anybody who's ever blown out some data on your home or on any machine you're working on. Back up first. Work on your backups. Don't work on the true copies. And it's just very important for forensic analysis. Right. And, and the first two kind of reiterate what I've already beaten to death. But... Um, <coughs> Now, collate mail, DNS, and other network and service logs to support and verify your fire, uh, findings. Not everything you're interested in is actually right there on the suspect system. You know, you, you may actually have network processes like mail being sent out if the system is taken over by a bulk mail or, or whatever, and you're going to find corroborating evidence on other, other systems on that network. So, you know, don't just consider the, the suspect system as the sole thing to be investigated. Um, and always be able to verify the integrity of your evidence. That, that basically means, uh, you know, be very careful about taking, uh, creating your, your, your file system images and then create cryptographic hashes of them. Um, whether you use MD5, SHA1, whatever, you, you need to be able to, to prove uh, at some point that nothing on the uh, suspect system has been altered. Um, yes, never use a tool you're not familiar with on live or original evidence. Again, this just basically says, you know, if you don't know how the system works, then find someone else, find an adult to help you. Or a 12-year-old boy, a 12-year-old girl, man. <laughs> okay, um, this is some more of the documentation. Uh, you want to itemize all the, all the actual hardware involved. Um, with the physical context, I mean, you want to you sit down at some point after you've gotten your file system data off and, and document the actual uh, computer system that's involved or, or systems. And you'll want to actually, as, as the example that's given here, you're going to want to actually want to document everything that, that uniquely identifies every piece of hardware in that system. So, uh, basically, it's just being incredibly anal. <laughs> 
because you know a defense lawyer is going to challenge everything possible, and you have to be very careful and and capable of proving that nothing has been changed, nothing has been swapped out, nothing has been you know modified or tainted. Um, logical context is basically you know, on a Unix system, for example, or even or even on a, a Windows box. Um, you know. All the mounted, all the mounted file systems, whether they're network mounts, whether they're local mounts, whatever, um, you want to actually document all the logical uh, things as well to, again, prove that that when they see the the suspect system in court, that it's exactly the way it was when when you began your uh, forensic investigation. <clears throat> because you you will be you know if it, if it goes to trial you you will end up testifying as to exactly what you did how you did it and and why what you did hasn't hasn't you know caused uh, the data that's being entered into uh, the legal record uh, to be to be tainted or, or suspicious uh, chain of custody uh, quite often will be challenged that's why that's why you need to keep a very full chain of custody very thorough yes Have to be what? Have to be what? Ah, the question is: Does the person doing the uh, the the data acquisition have to be an independent uh, person so that there's no conflict of interest? Um, well, it, it really depends on the situation. I mean, if it's if it's uh, uh, in in Rob's case, basically he he works for Health and Human Services, sure. and they they quite often have to deal with you know potential me medical fraud and things like that. Um, so they're not letting the, the IT staff of the, the office investigate that. And yes, quite often you want to make sure that the person is independent because if you can't trust your forensic investigator, then how can you trust the evidence that's being given to you to take the trial? So yeah, you, you would want to make sure it's uh, an independent individual um, or, or company. Um, quite often though, in large, in large companies, they, they will have, you know, a, a data security team and, and a forensics team that, that, while they work for the same company, they have no vested interest in, in protecting any particular person in that company. So essentially, they are independent as much as, as a company employee could be. But yeah, I mean, if you if you have the chance to get somebody who's independent, totally from the outside, yeah, that's probably the best best way to do it. There's one question. We do need to bang through this stuff pretty fast, but let's, let's hit the question real quick, and then we'll bang through it fast. Is there a question? Yeah. It seems like all this is really straightforward when it comes to the full fund kind. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about what you need to verify which drives is mounted and whatnot, it seems like you can't do any of that without touching it. Correct. That, the, 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 that the document, slide, documenting right? the hardware and everything is, a, 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 if I didn't make that clear, um, you, you would actually do that after you've already assured that, that you've, you've acquired all the, the data you're interested in on the suspect system, all the, all the file system data, all the volatile data, and everything, and you're, you're convinced that, okay, there's nothing else I want to, you know, I, I will need to gather from this running system or this, or this system I'm interested in. Now I can actually begin to, to document the, the, the components of the system itself. So yes, that will come at the very end. Because uh, as, as Rob pointed out to me, some of the things that he investigates, um, it's, it's physicians' offices and they can't afford to have the potentially compromised system uh, removed from the office. So, you know, basically you have to, you have to try and document everything and then get, get a verifiable um, forensic, forensic image and then leave the, the actual suspect system, you know, running in that in that office because you can't. Um, so, all right. Some of the things that you you basically need to understand is. Well, wait, wait. I, I yes. think everybody in here, if they don't understand the partition table and file system, um, they need a beating. So. Well, do you guys want want me to go over file system? Yeah. Okay, then we'll move through. Yeah, cool. Fine. No problem. Yeah, all that stuff. Partition. Hey, file system, if, file if cool. something is basically beating a dead horse, let me know because. Thank you. You know, keep in mind we were in jeopardy two nights in a row. Beer is evil. <laughs> no, it's beautiful. All right. <clears throat> Your goals. Basically, you want to make an exact copy of the backup. Basically, this is more beating a dead horse, it looks like. <laughs> yep, skip that one. 
All right, don't fuck with it. I got plenty uh, of tools, yeah. And, uh, well, I've only right, hit the second part. All right. You, yeah. Um, you, one thing that you have to keep in mind: a lot of drives now will have host protected area, um, you know, device configuration overlays, things like that. And you have to be very careful with your tools to ensure that when you when you are acquiring data off the actual um, hard drive file system, that you're getting the entire contents of the file system. That, that you're not missing some portions of the, the system that um, are being hidden by the BIOS or, or the dry BIOS. Um, in, in, older, in older Linux 2.4.1s, for example, um, some, some of the hard drives with odd, odd number of sectors would, uh, you, you, if, if you weren't careful about how you acquired that file image, you would actually miss a portion of the drive because the, the uh, drive itself would report back that it was smaller than it really was. So. Um, tool needs to be tested by an independent entity. Uh, yeah, don't write basically, your own basically, don't write your own forensic tools. This is all this says. <laughs> go, go. You, you use something that that um, it has been proven to work and proven to do exactly what you want and what you expect, so that you can back that up in in, in a, a court of law. Um, more dead horse. Uh, one of the one of the things, yeah, pre preparation of the forensic hard drive. Basically, uh, the the drive that you're going to to use to or drive or tape that you're going to use as a uh, copy of the the suspect system, you you want to wipe that drive before you actually use it. And and as as is suggested here, you want to you want to wipe it with a known uh, known pattern. You don't want to use like dev random because you don't want random stuff overwriting that drive. You want to use something like dev, dev zero, so that it's all zeros, so that you can guarantee that you know, everything that gets put on that drive you know, was put on that drive when you did so. It, when the, none of it was pre-existing. Um, and, and this basically ensures that. And this will also be part of your documented um, investigation notes. All right, and uh, again, some of the, the host protected area and things like that, you have to make sure that, that you know, whatever tool you're using to format the drive prior to using it, you know, will actually uh, overwrite those areas as well. This is how, how to do it. Um, yeah, read the CD if you don't want to wipe your drive. Yeah, uh, DBAN is a very nice um, CD-ROM based system that will, that will work on both x86 and Macs if you have to deal with a Mac OS system. Um, G-Disk. These are basically just a lot of a lot of known trusted tools for for properly wiping the forensics um, acquisition system before you actually begin to use it. Um, all right, yeah. Basically, DD. The nice thing about DD is is that um, it, you know it does a bit for bit coffee, and then afterwards make a cryptographic hash and uh, to prove that later. Just about I'll get to you. Um, to prove that, that nothing has changed. Uh, the the CryptCat and, Net, and NetC, which is actually NetCat, the, there's, a, there's a way, if, if your system is, is running and, and you need to, to uh, access the, the you, you want to save the stuff on a, on a, on a uh, forensic system that's actually on the network or on a network or somewhere else, you can pipe the, uh, you can pipe the uh, output from DD to NetCat so that you're actually not storing your, your, your acquired image locally anywhere. You're actually storing it somewhere else, which is another means of, of ensuring that you don't modify anything volatile or, or existing on the file system. Um, yeah, you had a question back here? That, that is true. And uh, uh, I'll go back to the first caveat, which is this is not my slide. <laughs> Yeah, we'll get there later in the slides. We'll spank through them pretty quick. So we get All there. right. It, it, quite often, quite often, if you're doing this by hand, it's a slow process. There are hardware systems that will that will image um, the drives thoroughly. That will do it very well, and and far more quickly. Um, let's see. It's basically just saying that in real life, you run across shit that you're not expecting. You're not going to run into the perfect scenario every time. And because of that, shit happens. Uh, you, your hardware may not work right. Uh, you're, you may go to plug into a port that's busted. Uh, the keyboard may be cracked in half. You never know what's going to happen. Sometimes shit happens. So uh, cover your ass. Yeah. 
No. No, never never yank the power. I mean, no. Well, if, if you just yank the power, you're losing so much volatile information, you're screwed. Yeah. yeah we, we, we Yanking the power, power, everything that was, that was being held in RAM, gone. And if you sat, if you sat in on the rootkit, um, the rootkit talks that, that were presented here, there, there are actually a rootkits now that live in RAM, live in memory solely. And you'll lose that. You'll lose all evidence of it. Well, it depends on what you do. And if you are going to shut it down, if you can do your data removal first, it's all in the path of every machine is different and what you can do is different in every situation. In some situations, you'll walk in there and be able to just image everything, including the RAM. In some situations, you'll walk in there and some guy will start shooting at you and put a bullet through his computer. Different situations, different times. Right. Um, you, you obviously don't want to install your forensic environment on the, the suspect system. So uh, what, what you want to do, uh, is, some people actually use the suspect system to, to create copies of the suspect system. I personally don't prefer that that be done. But one way to do so is to, to you know, have a bootable DOS, Linux, or BSD disk app with, with, that has been designed specifically for forensic use, and I believe he has uh, examples of some of those um, uh, as we go along. Um, Image Master is one that actually has a, a, pre, a pre-configured, I think it's a, a Win98 environment, that has actually been modified specifically for forensic use. Uh, Nopix is, is, a, is a reasonably user-friendly method for doing this, although there are caveats. You have to, you have to um, you you have to throw the no swap command line at your at your uh, kernel boot up because otherwise uh, one of the problems with some of the Nopix systems is that basically if it finds swap, swap space, it'll try mounting it. And if it, it, when it goes and starts looking at all the drives on the attached to the system that it's booting, uh, when it finds your 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 suspect file system, if it finds the uh, swap space on there, it's gonna it's gonna uh, it's gonna go ahead and and, and bring it up. Um, at which point you're now losing you're, you're losing the integrity of some of the data on that file system. Um, older version, uh, yeah, and if you do use Nopix, you need to be very very careful to make sure you use one of one of the more recent releases because older versions have do have some issues. For example, um, some of the older ones, even if you gave the no swap command to the command line, it would just happily ignore it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the caveat of being you know. Not just because the version is newer doesn't mean that it doesn't have a different bug that will affect you. So no, never, never actually go fire up Nopix to do your forensics without actually having done it somewhere else first, so that you again have a trusted forensic environment and you know exactly how it's going to act and what's going to happen, so that you can protect the integrity of the the suspect system that you're interested in. Um, again, this just goes over some of the some of the basics of of how to build the the forensic system environment. CD. Yeah, go to those links if you want to get good shit. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Modcom, I believe, is a, 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 a DOS-based one, which is actually pretty good. Um, in case, the forensics uh, version of Incase is actually, um, it, it doesn't, doesn't, the licensing doesn't actually require you to pay for it. More stuff. Just go to all these sites. Sure. Fire is actually an Opix based one. These were all these were all URLs, and I believe they will have they will have Rob slides up on the uh, DefCon site, so you can get them from there. Yep. Now, I saw some of the Penguin Sleuth Gate guys around here. Uh, let's see. These are these are commercial hardware solutions. These are systems that actually will do the data acquisition for you, but it's a, a hardware device, which which um, as was mentioned o- earlier, depending on how big the the suspect. Uh, file system is, it could take hours. And uh, some of these systems have, have been uh, d- built and optimized to the point where uh, they, they, like Image Master, uh, I believe will get a throughput of something like um, two, two gigs, um, like two gigs a minute, and you know, on a large drive, that's kind of nice, rather just than a, taking a day or two. Just as a side note, I mean, I personally don't do data forensics, but a division of the company I work for does and we just released a press release, which I don't know what the fuck it means. I don't know what computer does hell. But uh, we evidently did five terabytes of data in under 24 hours uh, for en- and did forensic analysis and everything else. So they say that's good, but that sounds like a lot of data to me. That would take a hell of a long time with some of those other solutions. And just more. Um, these are just examples of, of if you're using a, a tape system, 
for example, if you have a RAID system and, uh, and, and you need to get some data from a previous day for your investigation, these are methods that you can use to, to actually read data off the tape to put it onto your forensic environment to, to, for analysis later. Um, these, are, these are other, other means of uh, creating your forensic media. Um, hardware write blockers. Uh, this, is, this is basically a, a hardware solution to ensure that, that you, don't, you don't actually modify the, the suspect drive. Um, I personally use a Unix environment so that I can mount the, the suspect system read only. Uh, that's not always the, uh, possible with Windows systems. Again, here's and and you know just examples of uh, of of software write blockers. Um, one of the things you want to do is is uh, possibly you may be you may be having to to acquire a, a RAID image, um, so you're going to want to you're going to want to have uh, your forensic system to be as as optimized and and powerful as you possibly can to you know make the process not be a lengthy horrible thing. So, ATA, ATA promised that ATA RAID, serial RAID is actually a very reasonable and, and inexpensive RAID solution. These are, again, commercial software um, uh, data acquisition solutions. And more dead horses. And then the free solutions. Uh, these actually... Um, are uh, forensic forensic uh, acquisition systems that are available to law law enforcement only. Yeah, they they essentially do the same thing that that all the other ones do, but they they've been specifically designed to to ensure that that they they uh, they actually do what is required to properly prosecute. Uh, and these are, these will snap back and in case enterprise uh, are capable of of doing imaging over the network, uh, which is you know, that way you don't have to do things like DD and then pipe it out to NetCAD things like that. Of course, uh, they're quite expensive as well. Okay, basically, this if the system is running RAID, you need to be very familiar with how RAID how RAID works and and you know. What, what each different type of RAID, how it's set up so that you ensure that when you do acquire the RAID, uh, RAID array that you, that you, again, are, acquire, are acquiring the entirety of the virtual file system that, that makes up that system. Uh, this is an interesting thing that, that I actually didn't know until I talked to Rob yesterday. Um, on uh, Mac OS, on more recent versions of Mac OS, if you actually hold up the uh, T key, hold the T key down on, on boot up, it, it becomes, it, it boots up into what it, what it refers to as disk mode and that Mac then essentially becomes an external firewire drive that you can use as a, uh, as a, uh, a live forensics uh, environment to toss data onto. In image integrity, there's, there's checksums, there's hashes. These are all different means for, for verifying and, and providing proof of the integrity of the suspect system data. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, MD5 actually recently they, they've discovered that there are the possibility of collisions. Thus, thus, uh, I would say a, a good defense lawyer might be able to to bring up enough technical data uh, to prove that that the MD5 hash may not actually be valid, uh, at least enough to create doubt, which would you know then sink your 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 prosecution. Um, so I personally prefer SH8 one sum. Uh, these are just these are just commercial versions of, of hashing applications. Okay. These are different formats. Um, the the one I've basically talked about the entire time is a, a DD is basically a raw bit for bit copy of the drive. Um, in case uh, quite often all the all the the commercial systems are, are capable of reading the the. Um, disk image, the, the proprietary disk images that are made by all these different, uh, all the different other products like Incase and Sa Safeback, Snapback, and uh, Smart. Uh, basically, more, uh, you know, for more information, these are a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of URLs where you can find a ton of, uh, a ton of information on uh, 
data forensics, and there are there actually is a forensics mailing list. Um, I, I currently don't know what I think. I think it's on security Next focus, slide. so you might check. And that's about it. Questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You, 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 correct. On on the on the on the other systems that may actually affect it that are on the network, you you don't actually need to you, you don't actually need to uh, get a get a forensic image of that server because that's that's just an external system that just supplements what you're doing. It it is difficult, but 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 you know being very careful about documenting what you did to get that corroborating data and and you know doing things like okay I, I took a snap of the file system make it make a hash of that of that that log file you know that and then enter all that into your chain of custody documentation that will help so it's all about documenting even if you can't verify things it's all about documenting yeah it's basically it's just document the hell out of everything <laughs> yes sir on the right side Uh, there's various programs. Almost all of those programs can handle it. Um, yeah, some some of the commercial products will actually um, access the the memory contents as well. Uh, I personally will will just cat the contents of the uh, the kernel proc file system and cat it out across the net so to another system. Left side. Louder. Yeah, yeah. So I, I generally will not use DD on a live system. What what I will do is try to document uh, when the, the few times I've had to, to do forensic. As I said, I, I'm more of a network security monkey than than a forensic guy. But the few times I have done investigations on uh, on you know potentially compromised systems, I uh, basically I did not do the DD copy um, on the running system. I got on this. I got on the running system as, as you know, unobtrusively as I possibly could. Documented the hell out of everything that was on there um, as much as possible. And of course, you're, you're never guaranteed you're going to get everything. You know, if there's a if there's a really really well done rootkit on there, you're probably not going to find it. But you try your best to find everything that's potentially running, um, and then and then eventually at some point you do shut down the system, and then you make your bit for bit copy of the the the, the hard drive itself. And uh, as, as, I'll get to you. as I mentioned, with, with, with respect to RAID systems, you actually not only have to ensure that you, you get all the data from the RAID system, but that you can actually recreate that RAID array properly so that, so that it, it will not be questioned by the defense. Um, well, it will not be successfully questioned and thrown out, that you can prove that you acquired that and, and that you, you acquired it properly, and, and what, what the jury is being presented with is exactly what was on the suspect system. But yeah, you will have to power down the system before you take the image of the actual uh, file system itself. Yes? Um, if, if properly entered into the chain of uh, chain of custody, yes, and and you know if you can if you can if, if you're you're very careful about documenting how you acquired that data and 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 all that, yeah. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We need to go. All right. Thanks. Thanks, sir.